Um, please join me in welcoming to the stage uh, Special Assistant to the President and Director of My Brother's Keeper, Keeper Michael Smith. Thank you, Elise. Good morning, everybody. Come on up. <laughs> uh, I see you are the folks that didn't go to Dr. Biden's session this morning. Thank you for coming. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we are excited to be here today. We've got a powerful uh, panel lined up for you. Um, allow me to, to introduce everyone uh, who has just gathered on stage. First, we have the Chancellor of the Washington, D.C. Public Schools, Kaya Henderson. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we have Eloy in Spanish, Oakley, <laughs> uh, who's president of Long Beach City College. Uh, and we have one of the leading philanthropists in the nation, Tanya Allen, president and CEO of the Skillman Foundation. And Tanya is also the uh, co-chair of the Executives Alliance to expand opportunity for boys and young men of color. <laughs> So we're, we're, gonna have a, we're gonna have a good time here today. Uh, we're gonna talk about these issues. We're gonna talk about expanding opportunities uh, for boys and young men of color, talk a little bit about what's happening from a national level. Um, also, we've gathered folks that are doing this work on the ground in communities, have been doing it for many years, and are really leading the way. So we'll have an opportunity to have a conversation, um, both a moderated conversation and then with all of you in the room. Um, before we get started, I would just love to know a little bit about who, who's here, who's gathered here. So maybe just a show of hands, how many of you are educators? Okay, great. How many of you are administrators? Great. Government folks? All right. Philanthropy? Nonprofit? Okay, great. How many? Oh, what did I leave out? Journalist. Journalist. Thank you. The third estate. Uh, and how about how many folks are from big cities? Uh, more than 200,000 people. Oh, well, good. We're glad you're here. How many folks from smaller cities? Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, any tribal nations? All right, great. Well, it's good to see we have such a diverse mix. I think that'll help us to kind of gear our conversation a little bit. So I, I just want to tell you a little bit about My Brother's Keeper and why we're here today. So all of you probably know these stats. Um, so, you know, boys and young men of color, uh, in this country are facing some incredible odds. Um, if you look at all of the statistics and you line them up, whether it's entering kindergarten ready to learn, third grade reading level, unemployment, criminal justice, uh, boys and young men of color, black, Latino, tribal, um, and certain Asian American populations are really falling behind uh, their peers, be it girls or uh, peers of the same race. And so uh, you look at the stats, you've got boys and young men of color are more likely than their peers to be born into low-income families, live in concentrated poverty, live with one or no parent to attend high poverty, poor performing schools. Um, in schools and courts, these boys and young men too often receive harsher penalties uh, for the same infractions as similarly charged white males and are li less likely to be given a second chance. Um, you know, we saw a study that was released in the Washington Post recently uh, that said poor kids who do everything right don't do better than rich kids who do everything wrong. And so we continue to see this expanding opportunity gap. And you know, one of the most shocking statistics, while only 6% of the population, uh, black boys make up nearly half of the nation's murder victim. And so when, when you look at these statistics uh, and you stop and pause, you realize that as a country, uh, we have to do something about it. Um, at the same time, we also have to realize that boys and young men of color are not only challenges uh, for us to address, but they're also great assets for our country. They have unique skills and talents that we have to tap into. There was actually a recent um, campaign, an ad campaign that came out about black boys that said, you know, one in three go to college, three out of four uh, don't do drugs, seven of eight will not be teen fathers, 11 of 12 don't drop out. And when we look at these communities, they serve in, in the military at higher rates, they're active dads when they're dads in the lives. And so we have to also remember that we, we just have this pool of young folks um, that we can't afford to put on the wayside. And so My Brother's Keeper, it's about a moral obligation, realizing that America has to remain this place where if you work hard and play by the rules, we still have a responsibility to help you succeed and recognizing that when you succeed, we all succeed. Um, it's also about saying sometimes no matter how hard you play by the rules, there are unfair barriers and impediments that come uh, to boys and young men of color in this country and we have a responsibility to help kick those barriers out of the way. Um, and, and the third thing, it's about an economic imperative. You know, simply if you are a business person, 
realizing that we cannot continue to be globally competitive if we have this many young people that are sitting on the sidelines uh, that we can't rely on their skills and talents. And so we have to do something about it. And so that's why the president created My Brother's Keeper. It's a year old as of February 27th. There's a federal task force that's working on all sorts of uh, policy interventions. Uh, there is a My Brother's Keeper community challenge where nearly 200 mayors, tribal leaders, and county executives are agreeing to create plans uh, to close these opportunity gaps for boys and young men of color. And there's a private sector uh, series of parallels uh, that are gathering all sorts of resources to invest in communities across the country. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of idea on my brother's keeper. And now I'm gonna stop talking uh, and start having a conversation with the folks that are really doing all the hard work on the ground. So. Madam Chancellor, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, DC is one of the fastest growing public school systems in the nation. You are doing incredible work. What are you doing to really address these opportunity gaps uh, for boys and young men of color and making sure all youth can succeed? Well, like you said, Michael, we're seeing a lot of the same data that we're seeing across the country with regard to our African-American and Latino young people. In Washington, D.C. public schools, 43% of our public school students are African-American and Latino boys, and they are persistently lagging on all indicators, academic indicators, suspension rates, graduation rates, early literacy, the whole nine. And so, you know, by looking at the data, it became very clear to us that we needed to try to do something different um, to accelerate their success. DCPS has gone from being one of the lowest performing school districts in the country to the fastest improving. And our young men are improving as well, but not as fast as their peers. And so if you use a data-driven approach, then you have to have a different approach um, to figuring out why the people who are not moving fast enough, um, how they can move faster. And so we put together a series of strategies um, around improving some of the existing things that we've done that have shown really good results to try to accelerate that for boys. Um, and then innovating around some new things, soup to nuts from pre-K through 12th grade, what are things we could do differently um, to improve the outcomes for young men of color. So we've partnered with Head Start and Bank Street uh, to do um, an early learning, uh, an early childhood learning pilot where through parental engagement and professional development for teachers, um, we're actually working to improve outcomes for pre-K students, our, our uh, African American and Latino boys in pre-K. Uh, we have an early literacy initiative where we've called for 500 mentors um, to come and tutor our struggling readers in pre-K through uh, third grade, and we're using programs that we've used all across the city to improve reading, programs like Reading Lab and liter a Literacy Lab and Reading Partners and Reach Incorporated. These are programs that we use with all of our students, but we have called to action everybody in the city to become tutors and specifically focus on our young men of color who are struggling. Um, <clears throat> We're also doing all kinds of things around teacher recruitment to ensure that there are African American and Latino role models in classrooms for our young people. We have a summer literacy initiative for fourth graders and uh, we're opening a high school um, focused on uh, boys. Um, we're partnering with Urban Prep out of Chicago that has seen some tremendous results in getting uh, boys to college and Urban Prep will open their first expansion site in Washington, D.C. Um, finally, we're raising a ton of philanthropic dollars because we fundamentally believe that the best ideas come from our schools and our communities. And so we're raising $5 million uh, for a Proving What's Possible grant fund where school and community can partner together um, to apply for funds to innovate and create new ideas. Um, all of the ideas don't come from the central office. They come from the ground. Um, I think the other piece that we're doing, which is really important, is celebrating our young men. Mm. Um, I think far too often you hear about how terrible or what the challenge is or what they're not doing. And from you know everything from an honor roll ceremony, each um, advisory to celebrate the young people, young men who are doing what we ask them to do, to a college signing day, um, to all kinds of motivational and incentivizing things. We want to help our young men know that they are indeed assets and that we appreciate them and value them. Thank you so much. You can see why I'm so proud to live in a area where we have Chancellor Henderson at the helm. No moss is growing under her feet. It's amazing. I, I want a quick follow-up question that I didn't prepare you for, um, but I think you're quick on your feet. Um, this whole idea of investing in what works. 
Uh, it's something that's central to the, the strategy of My Brother's Keeper, and it's something that you'll hear the president talk about time and time again, you know, that we simply don't have enough resources to keep throwing uh, dollars at programs that have no evidence of effectiveness. And everything that you've mentioned uh, is rooted in a what works strategy. H how do you embrace that? And you know, a lot of communities are, are challenged by this idea mm -hmm. uh, of, of what works. Well, you know, my grandmother says there's nothing new under the sun, right? Right. Um, I think we have, DCPS has been very innovative in trying to address the needs of our young people. And we're seeing things that are actually working. That's how we're seeing so much success. And so figuring out how you take those things and, that are working and put a slight spin on it to target a population just seems smarter than trying to reinvent the wheel or come up with something um, uh, different. I mean, we've employed the ninth grade academy strategies as a way to improve um, our high school outcomes, and we're seeing tremendous results. And so then the question that we're asking ourselves is, is there a way to tailor the work that we're doing in our ninth grade academies for our young men of color um, so that they can see even more success more quickly? It's not always about reinventing the wheel or creating something totally new. Sometimes, I mean, a, a key portion of, you know, we say we engage, improve, and innovate, right? Mm -hmm. So we engage the community to figure out what it is that they want us to deliver. We improve on existing research-based strategies that are happening in the district, and then you spend some portion of your time innovating, right? But you don't shoot the whole wad on innovation, right? Because if you're truly innovating, there's a lot of failure that happens with right. innovation. And so I think the smart bet is you take the strategies that are working and extend, expand, um, and you save a portion for the real innovation. Um, and that's the way we're approaching this initiative. Fantastic. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, President Oakley, let's go to you. So you are at the helm of Long Beach City College, which is an incredibly diverse uh, community college that's in the heart of Long Beach, California. You've got a high percentage of Latino and AAPI students. Um, you've got uh, all sorts of student uh, uh, and academic support programs. Can you tell us a little bit about what you are working on uh, in Long Beach that's really helping, especially uh, with the incredible diverse population that you have? Well, first of all, uh, and thank you, Michael, um, we celebrate our diversity. We see that as an asset to the community of Long Beach. And we have this thing in, in Long Beach called the Long Beach College Promise, and we appreciate that the administration has taken some of that name uh, for the America's College Promise. But, um, but we really focus on owning every student from day one. Uh, we are a community college, but we are partnered with our school district, Long Beach Unified, which is the third largest school district in California, and we're partnered with Cal State University Long Beach, as well as the city of Long Beach. So we really focus on every student that comes into our schools from day one, from pre-K all the way to higher ed. We own them from day one. Every fourth grader takes a tour of Long Beach City College, spends a whole day there. That's nearly 7,000 students. Every fifth grader takes a tour of Cal State University Long Beach. So from the very beginning, we make it clear to everybody that they are not only welcome, but they belong at one of our higher education institutions. And we involve the city and all the nonprofits as well. So we really see this as community impact. This is not just uh, the school district passing off the kid to Long Beach City College, and then we pass them off to the university if they even get there. No, we, we own them from day one, and we take responsibility for them. And so it's really, a community initiative. The Long Beach College Promise is a community promise to every one of those students, uh, regardless of where they're from. And as you said, we are a majority minority institution, but that is our economic asset. Mm. We want those kids to grow up in Long Beach, we want them to succeed in our schools, and we want them to stay and help our economy thrive right there in Long Beach. Fantastic. Tanya, let's uh, move on to you. So you're at the helm of the Skillman Foundation uh, in Detroit, America's comeback city. Uh, doing incredible work there. Um, you're also co-chairing this Executives Alliance that has more than 40 foundations working across the nation to tackle this challenge with boys and young men of color. Can you tell us a little bit about both what's happening on the national level, how philanthropy is supporting, and what you're doing in your own backyard? Sure. I'm going to start in, um, with Skillman and Detroit and go up. Um, the Skillman Foundation is a children's foundation in the city of Detroit, and we decided that we were going to make significant investment in neighborhoods and as we did that, we began to talk with parents. And one of the things that struck me in those initial conversations is that when we were talking to mothers in the city of Detroit, they, had, they all basically started to say uh, the same thing. Help us 
save our boys. And every time I think about that, it, um, it uh, makes me emotionally get even more attached to this work because here were a set of women who uh, loved their children, were doing all that they could, but the constraints uh, and the barriers and the systemic issues around how boys were interacting with systems uh, challenged their ability to be good parents. And so as a result of that, the Skillman Foundation started to make significant investment in boys of color. And our investments ended up resulting in us make, ensuring that every dollar that we invested in programs, strategies, had to reach at least 50% boys. And now that may not seem like a mu much, but just think about this, is that when we talk about all of the programs, all of the things that happen in school systems, et cetera, what ends up happening is that they in, you self-select into those programs mostly. And most of the time they are girls and boys are not there. And so programs have not built the competency to actually serve boys well. So one of the things we wanted to do was say, if you're supposed to serve them, then do it mm. and do it really well. And so we try to provide supports to them and to lift up the best practices around the work. Um, and as we and we started to integrate that work into the work we were doing in um, high school um, reform and innovations. And uh, as a result of that, what we saw um, by adding these programs and deep supports to um, strong curriculum, um, a more rigorous um, educational setting, a more caring setting that we saw at graduation rates increase for boys uh, in these neighborhoods by 20%. And, 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 it was, uh, and we saw it over a five-year period. So it became really clear to us that you know, this is low-hanging fruit for us in terms of our country if we really make the investments and we um, uh, provide people who will support these young men as they're growing into men to be successful. And so our work as a foundation really um, placed, because we probably started some of it earlier than many foundations across the country, uh, we were very much in the beginning of a lot of the national conversations. And so uh, we joined with uh, several other foundations to establish a, um, an executive alliance for um, boys and men of color. And the intent around that was simply to try and give ph philanthropy a voice around what's happening uh, with boys and men of color, what's working, how we might invest together, how we grow the investment, and to also bring a moral calling onto our other uh, grant makers to say, this is something that we need to invest in, especially if we uh, want our country to continue to be prosperous because we can't be prosperous if we leave out a large proportion of our population. Uh, and especially as we're, um, if, and Lloyd just talked about um, um, a majority minority institution. Well, soon we're gonna be a, ma a majority minority mm -hmm. country. And so we really view this as an economic play for the city of Detroit and an economic play for the country. And so um, the last thing I would say about the Executive Alliance is that many of the members of the Executive Alliance joined with the president to launch My Brother's Keeper. We made a commitment of $200 million over five years that we would invest in uh, issues related to boys and men of color. And over the last year, we've actually made investments of um, about $100 million mm. in communities across um, the country. And so we're looking at these issues from a systemic approach as well as a place-based approach and a programmatic approach and trying to figure out how we lift up what's working in conjunction with the White House uh, so that we all, all of us, are equipped to do a better job for, these, uh, for this particular population in our hometowns. Thanks, Tanya. Can, can I pause on that again and you guys will have a response? And one year, so a group of 11 foundations, mm -hmm. um, which are not known for record speed, I used to work at a foundation, came together, made a commitment to invest $200 million over five years, and in less than a year has invested $100 million. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's extraordinary. It is extraordinary, but I would say 11 made the commitment and 40 made the $100 million. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it is extraordinary. And so I think what we have before us is that we have to make sure that we're not doing these investments um, individually. We mm -hmm. need to figure out how we begin to bring them together collectively to have real impact. Hey, just a, a quick follow-up question. Um, 
before I joined the government, I worked for the Case Foundation, and we launched this campaign called Be Fearless, which was trying to encourage more risk-taking uh, in the social sector, especially in philanthropy that we thought had become a little risk-averse. And one of the elements that we found uh, were common amongst fearless change makers and successful social change movements is that they made big bets. Um, they, you know, Daryl Hammond has this bet where uh, for Kaboom, every child uh, will have a play space within walking distance to him or her. Uh, a malaria no more said they will eradicate uh, malaria by 2016 in sub-Saharan Africa. And I feel like across all of your talks that you just gave, I heard big bets uh, for your communities or for your work. Can, can you just talk a little bit about how you come up with those and why that's important? Anyone who wants to take that? I mean, I think um, in order to, to get everybody involved, you, you need to really show a, a vision and, and really paint the picture of what this community, what this, our state, what our country will look like if we just engage in this issue and really leverage all the efforts. Because you know, in our community, just like every other community, there's a lot of players in this space. They're all trying to do work. Uh, uh, the nonprofits, the schools, higher ed, uh, city government. But if we paint a picture and challenge everybody to come together and leverage all these efforts, then we can see really big improvements beyond sort of the day-to-day 1% or 2% increases here or there, really see the kinds of increases in higher ed attainment and successful uh, job placement that we need to see in order to see this issue resolved. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you're solving intractable problems, mm -hmm. you need big ideas. Um, big ideas, I think, help motivate people mm -hmm. and inspire people to do things differently. At the end of the day, right, we're all doing our best, hardest work, mm -hmm. and it's not giving us the results that we need. And so how do you inspire people to do something very different? You've got to have a very bold mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, we announced that we were um, doing this Empowering Men of Color initiative, and we said we'll go out and raise $20 million mm -hmm. over three years. And first of all, $20 million, people were like, huh? <laughs> uh, okay, wait, hold it. And literally, in droves, people came out. and. And at first, some people were like, well, we're already doing that. And I'm like, well, if you're doing it, we wouldn't have these results, right? Mm. So what are you going to mm. do differently? <laughs> and I think it's inspiring people to do something very differently than the work that they are doing that the big ideas help yeah. to move. And even in your uh, call for 500 volunteers uh, to be <coughs> literacy partners, you said you blew through that in a week? Yeah, in the first week, we had more than 500 people who expressed interest. Um, so, you know, interest is interest, right? <laughs> then you have to fill out the form, and then you have to get cleared through a back background check and all of that jazz, right? So we've got over 1,000 people who've expressed interest, and we're processing folks and literally putting them in classrooms. I have way more than 500 young people who could use tutors, and so we will continue to you know, keep the call going and keep people. I mean, in an ideal world, everybody in my city who has a couple of hours of extra time should be trained as a reading tutor mm -hmm. and should be tutoring our struggling young people. When the whole entire city takes responsibility, then we get to the point where we don't have struggling readers over the long right. term, right? right? So let's start with 500. It seems manageable. And then you blow that out the water and people start you know, believing that you can do more. And that's what we need, a sort of sense of possibility about what has been an intractable mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I think I'm, I often think about this is how many of you guys work really hard? How many? All day, every day. No, you don't. I know you do. No. <laughs> I mean, well, here's my approach around this. If I'm going to work as hard as I do, if I'm going to um, lose sleep over this, um, then I'm going to do it so that we're going to have some real impact and not have some marginal mm. impact. And so I'm just trying to use my time well. Mm -hmm. So when I think about, and I actually do think about this really simply, like I'm a, if I'm away from my daughter, daughters or my husband, or if I'm spending time doing this work compared to other things that I think are crucially important, then every minute has to matter. And then I think the second thing is that I don't know if this work um, is as bold as it is doing the right thing and being courageous, being willing to say and put your name on the line that this is what needs to happen and trying to drive towards that. And I think most people are looking for courageous leaders. Mm -hmm. They want that. They, they want to have an impact. And when they see somebody who says, if you were doing it, 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> we wouldn't mm -hmm. have these outcomes. So now we're going to do this. Then they're going to be drawn to that leadership and they're going to be drawn to that courage because they too want to make sure every second of their time is used to make the greatest impact and not have some marginal improvements. So true. Thank you. Uh, Chancellor Henderson, I want to go back to you. So there's this Council on Great City Schools. Everyone here, I assume, <laughs> knows about it. You know Council on Great City Schools? Raise your hand. Yeah. Um, so it, it's really funny. So Council on Great City Schools is this coalition of uh, large urban school districts. And I asked Mike Casserly, who's the executive director, if my hometown was a great city, uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. He said, it's good, but not great. <laughs> Talking about a bold leader. So the Council on Great City Schools uh, created this commitment around My Brother's Keeper and has more than 63 uh, large urban school superintendents and chancellors uh, that have agreed to 11-point pledge to really address these issues around boys and young men of color. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that alliance and what that's meant for your work? Sure. So the council actually, probably a year to 18 months before My Brother's Keeper was announced, um, really did some a lot of research, spent about a year and a half researching issues around uh, black males in large urban cities and the lack of educational attainment, the barriers, and what we needed to do um, to respond to that. And so we had been studying as a group, this is an association of the 50 largest or 75 largest urban school districts in the country. And so we had been consumed by this because all of our data shows the same information and had been putting together a research platform and an action platform. And then the president sort of challenged us and said, all right, my brother's keeper. And we said, we're ready. And 63 of us stepped up. We signed a pledge to create uh, strategic plans within our districts um, to address this issue. And it's been amazing to be in what is a large professional learning community around this. So the council helps us, to, we share strategic plans. Um, at every single council meeting, we bring in experts who help us to, um, to learn about best practices, who uh, have courageous conversations about the data that we're seeing in our district. And so it's kind of like having a working group um, of people who are doing the exact same thing in lots of different ways. And so we're able to learn from people like Oakland, um, who've been doing this work for you know the last five years or so. Um, and they're able to provide technical assistance and, and training and help to people who are just getting started. But literally, I think the collective impact of 63 large urban mm -hmm. districts all doing this work together will be mind-blowing when we accomplish results. Really amazing, really amazing. Uh, let's, uh, President Oakley, I want to talk to you about data and evidence. I, I, there's this uh, quote from Einstein that says, uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Uh, so often in the work that we do, we don't even know if there are results. We're not tracking it, we're not measuring it, and yet year after year we keep doing the same thing over and over again and kids are falling through the cracks. Uh, and so would you just talk a little bit about the importance of data and evidence and measuring and tracking in your work and it's hard and expensive. How, how do you do it? Well, let me begin. I love another quote, which is, you know, you get the results from the system that's already designed in front of you. And so we are getting the results that we designed for, uh, unfortunately. So, so what we're trying to do is, is share data across systems uh, in Long Beach. You know, from the time these children and these boys get into school, we're tracking them. So I can tell you exactly what all those 7,000 fourth graders, how they're doing in their classes. And we can start looking at them, and, and we know what those barriers are. We, it, this is not rocket science. It's not like we don't know what's happening. We know. We've created these barriers along the way. So being able to look at data and understand what we as the system are doing to set up barriers, because much of this isn't the child's fault or the, the young man's fault. It's what are we doing to prevent him or her from achieving their dreams. So one of the things that we found in, in Long Beach, most of our 1,200 community colleges in the country use placement exams when students come out of high school. And so uh, these placement exams really um, uh, do not do a very good job of predicting successful uh, placement in college. And so uh, we have, as a nation, uh, convinced ourselves that most students are not college ready when they come out of high school, and particularly for young men of color. Uh, this is a common theme. 70% of students throughout the nation 
come to college uh, needing some sort of remediation. Mm. And of course, what does that mean? That they're gonna spend three, four years uh, in some sort of remedial classes. So what we found is the best predictor of college success is what they did in high school, what they did before high school, and how do we capture that data and use it in a way that we can place students. When we started doing that, we saw immediately a 300% increase in the number of students that were placed in transfer level courses. And of course, the largest percentage of that was students of color and young men of color. And once you give them that chance, they succeed. So we were able to do that because we captured the data, we were able to use the data, and we were able to, to really convince ourselves that the way we were assessing them before was wrong. And we had to then trust ourselves that these kids could do the work and they could succeed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the barrier that we set up. It's not, it's not that they're not prepared, it's that we're not prepared for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's so, you, you, you've got to know, you, how can you tackle these problems if you have no idea what the, what the challenge is? Kai, I wonder if, what, what you're doing in D.C. around data and evidence. So, I mean, part of it is the disaggregation of data, right? Mm. We'd, you know, the subgroup disaggregation taught us a lot about special ed kids, about ELL kids, about um, kids of color through No Child Left Behind. But then you've got to start breaking kids out by gender, right? You have to start going to finer gradations. And I think that's when we started to see that different young people are having radically different experiences mm. in DCPS, even though everybody is moving up. I mean, some people are moving up sharply and some people are moving up very slowly. And so we've now shifted to the point where I mean, we have an equity scorecard where we not we look at a number of leading indicators that you'd look at in any school district but we're disaggregating specifically for african american boys and latino boys right mm -hmm. we're now cutting our data to look at kids by different races different genders different all kinds of subgroups because we want to make sure that we are meeting the needs of all of our students right we know that data can mask what's happening for different kinds of kids and so you've got to be courageous enough and diligent enough to make sure that you're asking the right questions mm -hmm. all the time so that you see where the problems are and then you can begin to address them. Thanks. I'm curious, there are lots of educators in the room. How many of you think uh, your school districts uh, do a good job with data and evidence? Okay. How many of you think there's work to be done? Really interesting, really interesting. Um, I, I wonder uh, if you, you can just yell it out. Uh, for those of you that think you're doing a good job, is there a certain tool uh, or is it a person? What, what, what do you think has made the difference from you, for you? <laughs> okay, so you're looking at it a lot, but not necessarily helpful. Okay, Any, anybody else? Oh, Kaya, I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I think data is data, right? Like the point is what questions are mm -hmm, you asking, mm -hmm. right? What information do you want to know? And we're just producing data on mass and mm -hmm. hoping that the data will tell us a story. Well, we have to understand what we want out of the data, what, what we want to know. And I think that drives more useful mm -hmm. data, right? Not just this mass production of information, because there's lots of information out there that you could spend a lot of time and energy pouring over, and it won't tell you anything if you don't know what you're looking for, yeah. what you're trying to and find out. The thing I would add to that is that you have to be willing to make the pivots once you see the right. data. Mm -hmm. And right. so what I find um, with our investments in many of the schools that we're working with is they, um, they are learning the data, they understand the data, they're asking some of the right questions, but they're not nimble enough mm. um, to make the adjustments that would actually change the data. Yeah. Uh, or they don't have the kind of professional development that um, allows teachers to make the pivots that they need to yeah. make. You know, uh, Mayor Bloomberg started a program in New York called the Young Men's Initiative. Any New Yorkers here? Wow, hello, New York. <laughs> uh, so Young Men's Initiative, it's a few years old. We uh, actually recently profiled it in our One Year My Brother's Keeper report. Uh, but the mayor got folks together, and de Blasio has continued this, but he got all his cabinet chiefs together and said, we're gonna come up with a set of common measures, and we're gonna track our kids, we're gonna track what's working and what's not. You're gonna meet with me once a month, and we're gonna make funding decisions every month. Um, really bold uh, for, for that sort of work to happen. And, and that's how they continue uh, to do the effort around Young Men's Initiative in, in, in New York. 
So Tanya, I want to go to you back on this uh, idea of philanthropy and, and partnering with philanthropy. So lots of folks in the room are educators. There's mm -hmm. some administrators. How do you get through the gates of those ivory towers? How do you partner with philanthropy? How do you get the resources um, that really help to drive some of this work? Well, I think have a coherent plan <clears throat> and think about where you want to have impact across the continuum. So some people want to have impact at the programmatic level. Other people want to have impact at the system systemic level. And I think you got to figure out where you want to be on that continuum. Where is the foundation um, or philanthropy that you're trying to reach out to? Where do they want to be on that? Um, and then I think you have to engage them in partnership. I think that a lot of times foundations, um, uh, you know, they set up this protocol where you come with a good idea and they sit in judgment. I actually think that's the worst kind of grant making you can do. Um, I think that really the best kind of grant making you do is you listen to people who are talented, uh, who have some kind of coherent plan about what issues they want to address, and you marry that with their own intentions. And so I think you have to look at that. Just not don't look at these institutions as, um, you know, how do I get a good idea in front of them? No, you have to think about how do I get a good idea in front of them that they're interested in. So I always think that the best place to look is not at their guidelines, but at what they've already funded. Mm. Uh, so look at what they funded in those organizations. Uh, and then I, the last thing I would just say is that you're stronger um, together than you are independently. So if you can, um, uh, cobble probably isn't the best word, but it's the one I'm gonna use, cobble together a few partners um, so that you're really looking at this comp comprehensive or coherent strategy and come together, I think that you actually have, you have more weight in the room, you have more gravitas, and so will your strategy and your impact will as well. Uh, and then the last thing is, is just like we're talking about schools are data-driven, um, I think all of a sudden philanthropy is now data-driven too, which I think is kind of hilarious because I think philanthropy is usually about 30 years behind the world. Um, <laughs> and so we're now caught up to being data-driven. So if you can lay out clear metrics of what you want to achieve, um, not just the input, but what do you really expect the outputs are and be able to articulate how you're going to achieve them, I think you'll be in a better position um, to you know, get a magic key or a magic ticket into that room and into those investments. Or a golden ticket. A golden ticket, yeah. <laughs> I always mess up the analogies, et cetera, metaphors. It depends on what you want. No, it's I just It's a Harry Potter up. or Willy Wonka. It's, it's, uh, so Tanya, I love this idea of, of uh, what is the word you use? Cobble together. Uh -huh. You know, there's this idea of collective impact that's really taken off in an interesting way. I feel like in my time in philanthropy, we created this Hunger Games uh, where cool. nonprofits are competing against each other. And so, you know, the idea of collaborating with someone, we're competing for the same scarce resources. Do you think we've flipped to where foundations um, are now incentivizing folks coming together and, and thinking as a unit? I wouldn't say that we have gotten there, but I think that many foundations are looking to do that, and I think the Executive Alliance is um, an example of that. I mean, we're coming together because as much as foundations sometimes say, we want you to collaborate, you very rarely see any foundations collaborating. So it's kind of, you know, it's not what's good for the goose is good for the gander mm. kind of thing. Um, but I do think that we're trying to think through that because we know that the work by itself in the, these um, independent strategies will not have the impact that we would want it to have. So I think there is some momentum around collaboration. I don't think that we're fully there, but I do think that um, if we're looking for impact and scale, then you have to have collaboration. Um, and I think that many of the, or even, you know, I. Um, with the social innovation work and mm -hmm. you can a lot of people are trying to take these projects and scaling them across mm -hmm. the country and it's like a singular project or a singular program and I think that there's some success there but I think they're struggling yeah. you know many yeah. of these institutions are struggling when it's a singular project or a singular entity so I would say yeah I, I think we're leaning in that direction but I think um, as much as we're pushing um, our grant partners to lean in that direction. I think philanthropy needs to lean in that direction as well. Uh, and I think when we do that uh, with each other, when we do that with this, uh, 
private sector, uh, like My Brother's Keeper, the more impact we have. Mm -hmm. And so one just quick example is that um, we at, at, at Skillman have been investing in uh, youth employment as a part of our uh, boys uh, of color strategy, trying to make sure that young people have jobs that are available to them. And we started off when we put $500,000 on the table and then we knew that wasn't enough. So we ended up going to all of these other philanthropic partners to move the needle. And we were able to uh, get maybe about um, close to $4 million in investment from private partners that created about 3,000 jobs. And many of them employed young people themselves. And now we are now taking that and leveraging um, the um, municipal government to put investment in. Now that we're out of bankruptcy, we can afford to do this. Uh, so we have gotten them to put resources in. And I just think, you know, leaning in on, in on collaboration and metrics. And the last thing I would say about this is that, you know, we, our aim is to have 6,000 summer jobs, which is double the number that we had last year. And, you know, our team is on the line with the mayor's team and everybody else's team every morning at 7.30 doing a head count on the number of jobs that we're getting. Uh, and, you know, holding people, holding the uh, private sector accountable, not just in the philanthropic sector. You know, so my thing was, you know, we just came out of bankruptcy. We just spent all these millions of dollars with all of these uh, law firms, accounting firms, consulting firms. If you're any of those, no offense. <laughs> um, but I said, so what's your return investment? Mm. How many jobs are you going to, since we employed everybody at your shop mm -hmm. for the last year, 18 months, mm -hmm. now what is the job? How many people are you going to employ in Detroit? And I think that's the kind of thing we need to see more often in philanthropy, mm -hmm. uh, as well as in the, non in the nonprofit sector. I love this boldness that we're hearing from the panelists. And I, like, you've just got to be bold. You've got to go for it, because if you're not, uh, you leave so much on the table. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Chancellor Henderson uh, one more question, and then I'm going to come to your questions. And there are mics um, throughout the room, so if you want to start queuing up at the mics, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, so, Chancellor, let's talk about the women and the girls. Um, one thing that uh, surprised me when we launched My Brother's Keeper is there was some early criticism of why there wasn't a My Sister's Keeper. Uh, and, and, you know, our response at the administration is, the Council on Women and Girls was one of the first things President Obama created. Um, and now there's a, an interagency working group around uh, minority women and girls. There's a report that's out there. Uh, and we really see My Brother's Keeper as tackling this specific challenge around boys and young men of color, but being a raise all boat strategy. How do you look at the issue of the role of, of women and girls in, in the focus on boys and young men of color? I mean, <clears throat> what's interesting is Tanya's experience around mothers saying, save our boys, right, mm. is similar to our experience um, you know, when we announced our Empowering Men of Color initiative, sororities were the first people who raised their hand and said, we want to volunteer, right? Women stepped up and said, the best way to save our families is by saving mm. our men. Mm. And we were moved by that. Um, and, you know, I think, um, I, I guess I think it is a little insulting, frankly, um, to school districts and to those of us who are doing this work to think that we can only do one thing at a time, <laughs> right? I'm a little better than that. Mm -hmm. I can do more than one thing at a time. And just because I'm focusing on my young men of color, it doesn't mean that I'm not still knocking it down for girls right. or my English language learners or my special education students, right? Um, I, I just, I mean, my job every day is to make sure that all students in DCPS learn. And right now, 43% of them are not. If any of you are teachers, right, you know that differentiation is what you do all day, every day. That's all this is, differentiation. And when you work with your struggling readers, it doesn't mean that you ignore your advanced readers or your readers in the middle. We have range as educators. Mm -hmm. We're able to do more than one thing at once. And so um, because I'm focusing on boys, it doesn't mean that I'm neglecting girls. And I'm, I need people to get over this. All right. I hope we got that on video and it's going on the website. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, let's go to your questions. If you could just say your name and where you're from. Hi, my name is Stephanie Seed, and I work for a nonprofit and philanthropic advisory firm called the Bridge Fan Group. And thank you all. It's a very interesting panel and very exciting initiative. My question is around the time horizon of this. Uh, 
given that uh, the focus on data and metrics is is really great to hear. Um, and then in the one year My Brother's Keeper progress report, there's no metrics at all in the 57 pages. I mean, and it's too soon probably, right? But there's nothing on Have academic. you read all 57 pages? Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> um, you so much. Great report. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful detailing with Someone the activity. Someone read it, at least. <laughs> <laughs> great job with the report. But I mean, the great, great job detailing the activity going on. But um, I think part of the power of this is also thinking about how this moves everything from academic achievement to attendance rates to literacy rates to college persistence and so forth. And so my question, I guess, is that are we talking about this in your minds as a um, three to five year initiative? Are we talking about it as a generational thing before we see the needle move? Or what, what are your, um, what's the time horizon in which we can open year X of the report and actually see some, some progress? So let, let me start that. So My Brother's Keeper obviously was launched uh, February 27th of, of last year. Um, we put out our roadmap. The, the cabinet members that are on the My Brother's Keeper Task Force uh, handed the president a roadmap and a strategy uh, in May, the end of May, almost June uh, of last year. And we didn't launch the My Brother's Keeper Community Challenge until September. And so in many ways, this past year was about building the infrastructure uh, and beginning to implement. And then the next phase of this is really driving towards impact. And the impact is going to be the work, really, that these communities um, are doing all across the country. And they are all responsible for developing plans of action that have um, metrics that they will release public. They will have data dashboards that can be tracked. And so you, you better believe it um, that this president is not going to let us get by um, not being able very soon to report on some of the traction that's happening on the ground. In fact, when we gave him the uh, My Brother's Keeper 90-day report, uh, and you guys know how hard these reports are to put together. You know, we're all feeling really good about ourselves and having a roadmap. And he says to the room, this is really good, guys. Um, when are we going to get to a set of communities that we can look to for progress? And so we are all uh, are, uh, focused on that. And so for us, the administration was about trying to light a fire. It was about igniting. Uh, it was about trying to, I think, create some, some roots uh, in policy and communities and, and the private sector, bolstering the work that was already begun. Uh, but this is something the president says every time he talks about My Brother's Keeper that he and the Miss, Mrs. Obama uh, will be working on when, when they leave. And so this is, this is tree planting. Uh, this, is, this is something that will not end uh, in 22 months. I don't know if you all want to talk about what it means for you. Well, I think that you will see anecdotal evidence in the next couple of years, but I don't think you're going to see any real numbers move for at least five years. Um, I, and it's not to suggest that um, we can't, I, what I'm thinking about is more population level numbers. I think you got to give this time. This is, these problems are embedded in really broken systems, and it takes a long time to fix these systems, but we can show a ton of proof points. Um, and I think that you can look to some communities who will be, who are showing proof points and who will be showing proof points in the next couple of years. But yeah, I do think that this is a generational investment. And I think part of the challenge uh, around this issue is that we think that we can initiative our way in and out of this problem. And it's not. It, it requires a significant, sustained, generational investment if we really want um, our full society, for everyone to be included um, prosperously in our full society. I mean, I'll jump in. I think it's both and, right? Like, I mean, you heard Tanya say that in a short amount of time, they've increased graduation rates for boys by 20%. That is amazing, right? And changes the life of lots more boys. In the world of superintendency, where we have usually very short timelines, I'm working very fast to try to make <laughs> outcomes happen in the next two to five years, right? We have to produce results for the kids that are sitting in front of us. At the same time, I think this work is building systems that we expect will persist so that in the next generation and the next generation, we don't find ourselves in this situation. But I think, you know, you will see in school districts, in cities, you will see graduation rates raise, rise. You will see, you know, early literacy indicators go up. You will see suspensions drop. You will see, you know, truancy rates go down. You will see those immediately this June, next June. You will begin to see those happening and moving faster and faster. Thanks for the question. Let's go to the next one. I'm Raphael Heller from Jobs for the Future. I, uh, I've, I've heard a lot about how young men of color are doing and what 
you're, you're doing so urgently about it. What I haven't heard yet is your theories as to why young men are not doing as well as young women. Um, you know, what, is there research, are there working theories as to what is it about young men compared to young women that would, that would be different? I, from, from my perspective, um, looking at what goes on in, in Long Beach, which is part of LA County, which is you know, one of the most diverse counties nation you know it, it all comes down to to economic economic situation to opportunities in communities uh, and really it, it, it's about poverty and opportunities uh, and uh, you know I think for whatever reason culturally uh, this has had a greater impact on the young men uh, in communities who are drawn to all sorts of different options that may or may not uh, benefit them going forward. And us as a community, um, you know, having different expectations. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know, I haven't seen one working theory that I think uh, nails it. But at the end of the day, it's really about opportunities for these individuals uh, at the earliest ages and the kinds of expectations that we have of them. If we set the bar low for them from day one, they're gonna perform to that bar. We need to set the bar high for them from day one, and they will get there. And I think somewhere along the line, we decided that they are not going to be successful. And you know, quite frankly, that's a bunch of horse manure. They are going to be successful. We have to give them the opportunity to be successful. Yeah. So I um, would like to just, I, I was thinking about this. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw this, but there was an article that was circling social media, which was actually about a... Um, a uh, pretty wealthy African American man, and the uh, and the rules that he provided for his sons, um, and they were uh, things like you know always uh, look at a police officer in the eye, never put your hands in a pocket. So it's not just that I agree that it definitely is an economic issue. I definitely think it's a poverty issue, but I also think it's um, it's structural racism. Um, I also think that it is um, the narrative that we tell about these men, um, that before they even walk in the door, we have a story about who they are, mm. what they're gonna do, what's that possibility. And I think we gotta start, on t we have to start breaking down each of those barriers uh, and not um, collapsing them. I mean, so yes, we have gotta deal with poverty, absolutely. And yes, we, you know, we know we have to make sure that these young men have economic opportunities. But when we talk about poor young men, it, we're not talking about, um, I'm just thinking about a young man in our community. His name is James. He works three jobs, and he's a senior in high school. He's really worried about going to college because if he goes to college, then nobody in his house is working. Nobody tells James' narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, he's at risk, mm -hmm. not because he's black or a man or what, but he, nobody's telling the broad narrative of these men. And I think as we um, allow people to sum up these stories in such um, um, uh, narrowing ways, I think that we do ourselves as a disservice, do ourselves a disservice. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, next question. Good morning. My name is Cyrus Hackmat. I'm from Los Angeles. I'm the founder of examperformance.com. Um, Mr. Oakley, uh, you mentioned about opportunities for success. Uh, it appears to me that issues uh, in not able to reach your opportunities or your maximum potential, whether it's uh, students in the My Brother Keeper program or students, American students who are, quote, falling behind in the PISA rankings um, when compared to other countries, a lot of that has to do with motivation. While you may have the opportunities for success, the student needs to embody the right mindset to motivate themselves to achieve what you are giving them the opportunity to reach. And studies by Dr. Carol Dweck and others like Jeremy Jaminson show that by improving motivation, mindset, you can also improve self-efficacy and lower uh, dropout rates as well as help overcome stereotype threat. Uh, this is something which you are the educators that you know of. Myself, I'm a real estate developer. I'm an attorney, and I helped create a company for my own social giving cause to help motivate American students to achieve. And on that note, have brought a team of doctors who work with Olympic athletes to help accomplish that. How can I get my program into your hands 
to help your students, whether it's through a pilot or free of charge? Okay. Well, you know, first of all, to your point, you know, there's a great okay. saying that um, if somebody knows that they can catch a bus, they're going to run. That's the motivation. So if they know that they can achieve in education, if they know that it's, it's possible and they believe it, they're going to run. So we need to do, we need to ensure that there is a systemic structure in place that allows for the motivation that you talked about. So, I mean, certainly, I mean, uh, we're, we're happy to, to look at your program or any other program, but at the end of the day, it's about looking at the entire system and, and as a culture. How do we motivate these kids and do we give them the opportunity to believe that they are going to catch that bus? And to, and to the latter part of your question, for any of you uh, that are interested in connecting with My Brother's Keeper, the best way is to connect with your community. And so you can look at uh, whitehouse.gov forward slash MBK and find a list in our, in our report of every single community that has taken the challenge. Uh, and you could go to mbkchallenge.org and sign up as an ally to be connected with these communities and simply ask the questions, uh, how can I help? And in almost every community, it's a mayor's office that's running it in partnership uh, with a series of local nonprofits and philanthropy. So I, I would encourage you all to do that. Thank you, sir. Can I pick oh, up on this motivation yeah, uh, thing for a minute? I mean, it is, it, you know, I, I think every, every single day when I was a little girl, my grandmother used to tell me, you know, you're so smart, you could be the president of the United States. And I grew up really believing mm -hmm. that, right? Like, really believing that I could be the president of the United States. We don't tell our young men these kinds of things at all, right? In fact, the narrative is written before they walk in the room, as somebody said earlier. We're not, it's our fault. It's not their fault. I keep hearing people talking about young people are not motivated. Well, we're not motivating them. Schools are not places that are interesting. Mm. They are not exciting. We're remediating people to death, right? Mm. I don't want to sit in a double block of anything, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so why do I think that our young people want to, right? But when I put, you know, when people give us money for at-risk kids, they want more social workers and more psychologists and more remediation and more, not more art and music and PE or recording studios or dance or whatever. And we have to think about this in a completely different way where we have to stop trying to fix kids and we have to fix ourselves. We have to give kids something to come to school and to be excited about. We have to give kids things in the community that makes them want to participate, not shut them out. Mm -hmm. That's the motivation piece, right? It, it is what we say and do as adults. It's the structures that we create in the spaces that we keep them in all day, every day. And that's the kind of motivational stuff that we've got to start rethinking. Right. Amen. So. Uh, <clears throat> We are at time, so if the folks at the mic, give me rapid fire questions. Um, hi, my name is Gage Caswoodle. I'm from New York, and I have a nonprofit organization, which is a perfect segue. We teach narrative filmmaking workshops to at risk teenagers. And so I was just going to ask if you guys were talking about data, if you have information about arts education programs and how it's actually proving to be more effective, and how someone like me could then, you know. Hold your answer. Next questions. question. Someone choose to write through down your answer. Next question. Uh, hi, I'm Tim King, founder, CEO of Urban Prep. Hey, Academies in Chicago. Hi, right. Kaya. Nice to see you. Um, we're real <laughs> proud to be partnering with DC public schools around uh, their initiative for black and Latino males of color. Um, my question is, I'm, I'm curious to know um, what you need from communities and from nonprofits in order to advance this mission. You talked a little bit about the challenges that you're facing. What about the opportunities that exist for individuals and nonprofit organizations to help you move things forward. And finally, pitch, I'm doing a uh, Future 15 session at 1250 that's focused <laughs> on changing the narrative around black male achievement. So if you're interested, room 15, see you there. <laughs> Good job. Who wants to take the, uh, the data question quickly? Uh, the arts question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. What, what we have found, because we've actually invested a lot in arts education, is that if young people actually have the ability to do a couple of things, one, work with an, an artist, two, um, actually practice and develop their own art, that you will find that young people feel more equipped to do everything else. 
I mean, so it's really about building confidence, building competency in young people in ownership um, of their own creativity and their ingenuity. Uh, and that's what we've seen in our data. And, uh, and so what we find is that, um, and I, if I could just riff off of this for one second, because I think Kaya's point around this is that arts education, in my mind, is about creating solutions. And usually, most of the strategies we have are about fixing problems. And we got to flip that if we're going to be successful. Yeah. All right, 30-second answer to the last question. Yeah, we've plowed millions into requiring an art teacher, a music teacher, a PE teacher, a foreign language teacher, a library in every single one of our elementary schools, every single one of our middle schools. And now, high school will move forward with requiring 20 different electives at every high school. Why? Because you have to make those kinds of investments, because that's what um, is going to help keep students engaged. That's what's going to help develop imagination and creativity. And so you put your money where your mouth is. If it's important to you, you do it. And you resist this narrative around budget cuts and all of this other kind of stuff. I had to close 13 schools in 2013, 15 schools in 2013. And I took the $8 million that I saved and plowed it into ensuring that mm -hmm. there's an art teacher in every elementary school, mm -hmm. that there's a, right? So yeah, OK, you make tough choices, and then you invest in mm -hmm. the things that are really important. All right. We've got to close. We're five minutes over. Please thank our incredible, fearless panelists. And thank you all for being here today.